And I thought I'd do something a little different today for today's video. A, um, this is some literature we found oh, back when the dealership was still open. This is actual the countertop for the dealership from back in the day, and, and it's still here today. And uh, here was this pile of literature wrapped up in uh, baler twine. But other than that, in really great shape. And so I got it all in protective sleeves and put it in a three ring binder. And what it was, was a, basically a salesman guide, a full product line. Uh, had a piece of literature for almost every piece of equipment. I'm guessing there's a couple that were robbed out for whatever purpose, uh, you know, to give to a customer or something. Like the 60, because uh, it starts with the tractors. And of course the first page of the 70s, the sturdy 70 row crop and the 60 pages missing, so I'm going to have to find myself a good piece to replace that one. But it was neat to me was it showed financing down payment as low as $129.60 balance on easy monthly payments. Um, then you had a list of one tool prospect list and a dealer name and then you would put your customer names down and apparently someone from the family never followed through with using this because like I say, it's all... Pretty much like brand new so we get to the row crop 70 what i can figure this is all about 1941 and seeing how it was in the shelf and in great or in good uh, storage conditions and everything and never used these are all just like brand new pieces of literature oops i missed a page I won't spend too much time on any particular one, um, probably more time on the tractors, but there's quite a few pieces in here and to keep the video from getting too long. Just like I say, like brand new. So stick that back in there. A 70. Uh, rubber tires, mufflers, and fenders down low, down pillow, hello, down payment of $184.80. Um, literature for the standard. I've had people ask what's the difference between a standard and the row crop. Row crop had adjustable wheels that could be in wide front generally. Back then, they were all narrow fronts like this, but they were for the parts of the country that were farming row crops like corn and mostly corn. So, stuff you had to cultivate, go back in. Um, Standard tractors were more Western states where it was just a uh, well, wheat country. And so they didn't need the adjustable wheels and, and they were a lower profile tractor. And the standard was a little more money down, 184 versus $193. There was the row crop 80. Uh, they didn't do much to over update the 80 like they did the other models like the 70 giving it the styling um, But that was not their biggest horse at the time and The back of each piece showed well it was in the lineup More money down for an 80 80 standard Once again like the 70 standard as far as a fixed tread width configuration uh, just intended for the plain states where they were doing tillage and planting wheat uh, not anything where they're going to do cultivating or anything like that where they needed uh, either clearance underneath or row width settings the Oliver 90 which was only available as a standard configuration uh, it was essentially considered for the big country out west uh, guys that were in the Midwest probably weren't farming quite that big and so it was not ever set up as a row crop tractor. And then there was the Oliver 99. See, we get to $318 down payment for a 90. The 99 was basically the same tractor, had a higher compression engine, more horsepower. A few, uh, seems like a couple other bells and whistles, but that was the biggest thing was the extra compression providing extra horsepower. Now we're into combines, the Model 2 Grain Master Combine. 
and the prospect list uh, turned pink, but I don't have a piece of literature for the Model 2, so that's another one I'll need to uh, fill in the gap on. Here's the Model 6 with new rubberized draper. Uh, the six foot wide combine. Oh, this one's a, kind of a neat piece. Maybe I'll pull that one out and open it up. I th think it spreads out if I remember right. Yes. The back here. Showing a breakdown of the combine. 20 bushel grain tank. <laughs> we couldn't stand that now. Hundred and forty six bucks down for the uh, Grain Master Model Six. So it's right up in there with a tractor. That one got a yellow sheet. Um I'm apparently missing the literature for the model twenty Grain Master. Then there was a model thirty. Full rotary type straw walkers. Um, most of these combines had their own engine. This was back before tractors had independent PTOs and it was just better to have an engine on the combine and all you really needed was something strong enough or heavy enough to pull it. And even the 30 required its own operator back on the combine. So it was a two man job, one to drive the tractor, one to drive the combine. Whereas we flip back to this model six and it's pretty much all self-contained. Then the Red River Special Thresher. So even at that time, uh, a thresher was a stationary unit where you'd bring the uh, shocks of wheat if you'd harvest them with a binder or whatever that was still getting done and belt driven off a steam engine or a gas engine or whatever you had for power source. And $209 down on the uh, the 22 inch, the 22 by 36 inch, which was the measurements of the uh, the cylinder that did the uh, threshing corn pickers. Let's see. At this time, the combines were all made in Battle Creek, Michigan, which worked out good for us. That was close enough; they could uh, go over and just get them from the factory. It's about an hour's drive nowadays. A lot more back then, I'm sure. The number one corn master. And it was PTO powered, but they show it being run with a 60. And I think this one was actually set up to also be a mailer, and that's why it's got this blank spot right in here. So you could uh, you kind of see it did have a crease right here. Um, and then you could fold it in half, put the customer's address on it, and mail it to them if you're going to do it that way. Alan, the old seal is right there, so it was folded at one time. I can see the two halves. The Corn Master. Uh, this doesn't. This is the number two, apparently. Yes, it is the number two. That was a fairly popular corn picker back in its day. get the plows which tractors were made in Charles City Iowa oh the plowmaster plow which was a very popular plow number 100 two base 14 inch plow um, down payment the lowest $23 and 56 cents be nice if they had the complete price in here I do have a pricing book from a about 10 years later, so they wouldn't really correspond to this stuff. Uh, some of the, all the tractors are different. A lot of the plows are different. Sturdy is the word for Oliver. That was one of their catchphrases at that time. I think we saw it back on the, uh, the sturdy standard 70. Yes, we saw it back on the tractor stuff. Now available Radex plow points. That was new. Um, the name Radex came from it was 
designed to be like a razor's edge and kind of self-sharpen itself. Prior to that, uh, plowshares would get worn. You'd have to take them off and take them to a blacksmith or do something to sharpen them. And these were essentially a throwaway plowshare, but they really revolutionized it. Just uh, save time, save money. Right there. That's the Model 109. Let's see what else we got here. The 214, 2B, 212B, 312, and, and that essentially came down to um, the size of the bottoms and how many of them there were. So a 212B would be two bottoms, 12 inches, each bottom's 12 inch cut. And all the way up to a 414, so four 14 inch bottoms. So I didn't have as many prices for that, but a uh, 214 uh, plow down payment of $27.25. Oliver 216, maybe they do have them all in here. Been a while since I've looked through this one. This one's dated 1939. Most of these literature pieces are dated, or pretty much all of them that I've seen. Um, I'll have a form number that usually starts with A for most of the agricultural stuff, uh, I for the industrial. And like this one here for the combines, form A2, A420. Dash 10 M, M means a thousand, so 10,000 copies of this piece of literature were printed. And then 240 right next to it, that would be February of 1940 was in that was printed. This one here, A412, that was printed 12 of 39, and they printed 20,000 copies of this one, 20 M. Of course they were it's a smaller brochure for the plow. They were selling more plows than combines, so I think they could justify to print more plow brochures. Uh, they're big base plows through the 18 inch cut, two, two uh, 18s or three 18s. So yeah, some of this uh, literature is older than others because they would print a lot at once just to save money and so that's why I'll, you'll see uh, some of these from 1939 and then once again if I go back to oh like this row crop 70 piece that was printed in 1941 February 1941 uh, some more plows 316 416 516 they were making good sized plows back at that time and this is another one you can see because of the line here, important information. You could put the customer's name here and uh, direct mail it to them. Fold it in half. Well, let's open this one up and see what it looks like. Well, this one has two hand cranks. Someone was recently asking me if I knew of any uh, Oliver plows with two hand cranks. The number 416 shows uh, two hand cranks instead of you. Most Oliver plows have one hand crank if it's mechanical lift, hand crank on the mechanical lift side, and then a an adjustment lever like this one shows here on the furrow wheel side. So it's interesting that the uh, 316 has only uh, has a crank and a lever, but you get up to the 416 and you got two crank uh, adjustment cranks. Oh, Harrow's, which was what they called discs back then. Power angle disc. Had no wheels to lift it up, but you would uh, pull this lever and you could adjust the angles of the blades so that they cut more or less and you'd put it where they were going straight for transport because you just drug it down the road, no wheels. But then again, uh, guys didn't drive to the next county to uh, do their farming back then either. At least not here in Michigan. Uh, wooden uh, bearings for the disc gangs. 
And they had to drive him down the road. More disc arrows, I do believe. And another TDM, TDW for modern tractor power. Still not, no wheels on it though. Horse drawn ones. This one was printed in 1936. They printed 30,000 copies. This is a pamphlet style more where it folds. You can see from the hole punches, but it wasn't designed to be mailed out. They just kind of, some of the literature at that time looked like that. Oh, let's see, spring tooth harrow. Those must have been pretty cheap. $5.15 pay, uh, down payment. More spring tooth harrows. The rollover self cleaning harrow. I think you could trip that and the teeth would roll around and dump the uh, weeds or whatever roots that were caught in it. So you don't have to get off and do it. Once again, no transport wheels. Spike tooth harrows. Let's see, this one was printed in December of 39. What do we got next? Pulverizers and phalivators. What we would probably call a pack packer now, that one. Even horse drawn. Phalivator, which we would call a cultivator now, I'm sure. For summer fallow and weed control. Summer fallow was uh, more of a western thing, but you'd leave the, wouldn't plant a crop on the field, but you would uh, go out and till it every now and then to keep the weeds down. And uh, they would let the moisture build up in the soil and then the following year you would, or that fall, but you would plant weed on it and use that moisture reserve from the year before to help the crop grow. Corn planters. See, this one was printed in February of 1940. Still a horse-drawn unit. Uh, this was a uh, Springfield, Ohio. Back then was where these things were made. Uh, the American Seeding Machine Division, which they were part of the merger between Oliver, Hartpar, Nichols and Shepard, and American Seeding. There back in 1929. The superior, oh, and they hole punched right through the model number. The 9D, the Oliver 9D, oh, that was probably NO period, number 9D, three wheeled planner. Once again, sturdy is the word for Oliver. Headquarters, Madison Street, Chicago, Illinois. And then we got uh, cultivators. I'm sorry, this is a check row planter. Uh, if you don't know what a check row planter is, there was a long roll of wire with essentially knots in the wire. And as those knots went through the planter, you can see the, maybe just see it right there. Pull it out. This is another tri-fold one. I'm getting that centered up. There's a wire here, and every time a knot would go through, it would trip the planter mechanism to drop some seed down. And when everything was set up right with your spacing, the hills or individual sets of corn were the same distance from all the other ones, no matter this way, crossways, or diagonally. And so you could cultivate diagonally and crossways and get more of the weeds. But every time you got to the end, you had to move your move your wire over for the next set of rows so they would trip at the right time. But it was uh, mounted right on the tractor and their pipe frame mounting system and uh, the mechanical lift on the tractor lifted it up and down. Uh, grain drills. That's a little bugger. Ten, number 10, five disc. This was printed in 41. So they did keep printing these more pamphlet sized ones 
later. You can see by the handles behind it, that must have been horse drawn. Oh yeah, one horse grain drill. Here's a tractor pulled one, the Superior number 26. I've got a couple of 26s in my collection. That was a very popular drill. Uh, changed some over the years just because they made it for so long. This is probably one of the newest brochures in here. This one's printed, uh, that'd be April of 41. But the reason they called them Superior was that was the name of uh, the company, American or American Seedings model line was called the Superior and they kept that name when Oliver and them merged. Getting up into little bigger ones, the Model 38, they made that for quite a while too. I like this one. It's almost like the newer models or newer planner. It's got it carrier wheels on the front to uh, support the, dr uh, the the drill with. Big wheels in the back. That's, I'm trying to remember if there's a better picture of that on the inside or not. I've got, I do believe I've got a 38 out there as well. These are the big wheels I was mentioning that go on the back side to act as uh, seed firming packing wheels. The low down press wheel. And then like I was saying, with the carriers in the front, it would be rope trip. So the whole, uh, oh, it's a chain drive, so one of the packer wheels would drive it and lift the uh, discs up, but I'm guessing the packer wheels stayed down all the time. I'm not 100% sure on that one. Cultivator weeders. This was a weeder just because there was no uh, spacings for rows or anything. Because after your ground was already worked up, maybe it rained or something like that, and you hadn't got the crop planted, but the weeds were starting to come up, you could go out with this and it would tear up the little weed seedlings before you planted and not have to do a heavier tillage pass. You probably could use it in freshly or newly sprouted crops, depending on how deep you had it set and uh, conditions and everything. I've never seen one work, so I guess I wouldn't be an expert on that. Uh, roll or tractor mounted cultivator is very popular. 70 with a four row cultivator mounted on it. Two row was pretty common, but two row disc cultivator. Mounted on a pipe frame just like but um, it was essentially, it would kind of pull the disc up, or the disc, the soil up around the plants for cotton, row, or, uh, cotton and corn and other row crops. Walking cultivators. Now there's a, <laughs> this is printed in 37. I don't know if you felt like you got a lot of it done at the end of the day, but you probably felt like you got a lot of it done at the end of the day. More walking cultivators. I don't know why uh, they had walk behind when I would I would have opted for something with a seat on it myself, even I have to look at the backside of a horse all day. One row, two row cultivators. You're starting to get big time there. Hope the horses don't eat the crop. Rotary hose. A 
Once again, weeders, well, right there answers my question. They show uh, check row corn in there. Probably when the corn's good and small and the weeds are even smaller, you can go in there with that weeder and hopefully miss the uh, plants. Maybe someone out there watching the video uh, knows more about it and can add something in the comments down below. The hay tools. 21B mower. PTO driven. That one shows it with a steel wheel. I haven't really, uh, I don't know if I've ever seen one with a steel wheel on the back. Definitely would be a good job for a 60. Didn't take a whole lot of horsepower to mow hay with just a sickle bar like that. Clip cut mower. Once again, another sickle bar mower. Right here they call it the horse mower. Don't know why you'd want to mow your horse. Hay loaders. I almost had one of those one time. There was a real nice one just down the road at an auction and someone wanted it a little worse than I did. I couldn't attend that auction so I put an absentee bid so and it went higher than my absentee bid. But that was back before uh, well they might have been bailing by this point but a lot of guys would load it loose and right up on a truck and then pick it up in piles and put it in a hay barn. Manure spreader, number 11. Um, this is another one that was designed to be folded and have the address put on. That's why the front of the manure spreader is missing off the literature. Once again, now there, the whole thing's in there now. We believe you'll say, I want an Oliver number 11 manure spreader. If yours is a large farm, the number 11 is right for you. Built to handle quickly and easily behind modern tractors, small enough to help you get more value out of manure through quicker application. Now you'd probably just pull that with your side-by-side uh, -side or something like that. Horse drawn. Oh, yep, they had a special attachment on the back for uh, putting lime on your fields. You might be able to, there's actually spreader discs down there. You could take them on and off to use your manure spreader as a lime spreader. Oh, another, another number seven which could be either pull type or a four wheel, basically a horse drawn. Beet, bean and potato tools. They had a lot of stuff going on and for 1941, they still had a lot of horse drawn stuff. It tells you there were still customers out there wanting it. Sugar beets uh, supposedly in our area were quite popular at one time and then the local processor, processor uh, closed down and uh, and that took care of the sugar beet market in my area. But you get up in the thumb of Michigan and there's a lot of sugar beets growing up in there in that area. And if you're wondering maybe what a sugar beet is, it's a root crop that grows in the ground and um, but it's very sweet has a high sugar content and they use it to make table sugar I've tried a chunk of uh, uh, sugar beet root and it is very sweet right out of the field uh, the excess or damaged ones or whatever uh, often get sold for 
used to get sold for deer bait. I'm not sure where the DNR stands on baiting deer at this point. I don't follow that too closely. Potato diggers. There's still some potatoes growing in my area, not as many as there used to be. Oh, Stover was another company that, I'm trying to think if Oliver actually bought it. I don't think so. I think they made hammer mills for Oliver or worked together. I mean, this literature actually shows, yeah, it doesn't use the Oliver uh, form numbers and it says Stover Manufacturing and Engine Company, Freeport, Illinois, jobbers everywhere. Again, a different form number. Wagons and trailers. Oliver did not make their own wagons and trailers. At first they had, uh, I don't know if the very first, but Peru. I think there's a piece in here that tells about Peru wagons from uh, to see um, that does have an Oliver uh, form number on it but Peru was eventually bought by electric wheel company and that's who Oliver stayed with up until they you could get running gears up into the 70s and 1970s that is The wooden farm truck. They even had dairy carts or hand carts. Someone might have one out there and not even realize it was an Oliver. I don't even see in the literature where they say Oliver on them. But the wagon boxes obviously did. But the, uh, it'd be kind of neat to have a Oliver uh, dairy cart or hand cart. Uh, well, let's see. We're getting close to the end. Oh, uh... Oliver and Kaksha had a good relationship before uh, White bought both of them out. And uh, uh, the Oliver Kaksha number six green, number six B grain binder, the binder of few repairs. That was made by Kaksha and sold as an Oliver here in the United States. Of course, at this time, Oliver was making tractors for Kaksha, the 60, the 70, um, 80, 90. So... Kind of a two-way street. They were uh, filling in gaps in what they had from the Cockshut lineup. And Cockshut got a line of tractors to sell before they came out with their own line. Another Oliver Cockshut, the number two grain tractor grain binder. What is this one dated? 1941. So it's relatively new compared to most of the stuff in this binder. Corn and row binder. Once again, another cockshut piece built by cockshut. And I think we're just about to the end here. Yeah, that is, that is it. So that was essentially the full lineup for Oliver around 1941. Just a couple of pieces of literature missing in there that I need to get around and I'll see them at shows and Either I'm too much of a tightwad and think they're asking too much or decide I'll come back later and then they're gone. So I just need to do it. But I appreciate everybody watching. And we'll do this again someday in the future if you like it. So let me know and we'll see you in the next video.